This show is supported by State Farm. You have insurance for your home, your health, and your car. Why don't you have insurance for your small business? So many small business owners think they don't need or don't even know about small business insurance. Protecting a source of revenue is one thing, but so is protecting all of your hard work and your team members. State Farm agents are all small business owners too, so they know how to help small business owners choose personalized policies that fit their budgets. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Talk to your local agent today. If your roof starts to leak or your floor's really squeak, you live in a money pit. Money pit. If your basement needs a pump or your place looks like a dump, you live in a money pit. Money pit. Pick up the telephone, fix up your home sweet home. I call an 888 money pit. Coast to coast and floorboards to shingles, this is the Money Pit Home Improvement Show. I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. And hey guys, we're here to help you take on projects you want to get done around your house. All you got to do is help yourself first by reaching out to us at right here in the studio. You can do that by calling 1-888-MONEYPIT. That's 888-666-3974. Or the easiest way to reach us is to go to moneypit.com slash ask and click on the blue microphone button. Whatever's on your to-do list, slide it right over to ours. We're here to educate, to inspire, to help you build some confidence. We're even kind of home improvement therapists if things aren't going so well. We understand. We've been there. So reach out to us with your questions. We are happy to help. Coming up on today's show, if you have ever thought of adding hardwood floors to your home, you might be surprised to know that some hardwoods are, well, actually not as hard as others. We're going to share some tips on how to choose the most durable hardwoods for your home. And here's a question to ponder. How often do you wash your bathroom towels? Well, you may want to rethink this after you hear what researchers have found out about bacteria that grows in those towels. It's pretty gross. We're going to have some details coming up. (laughs) And we talk a lot in this show about remodeling projects to improve the comfort and value of your home. But a new survey says that three in four Americans are actually making improvements to their homes now to help them stand up to severe weather. We'll share what those improvements are. And what projects are you guys working on? Whatever you are doing, reach out. Let us know what your project questions are. We're going to share some tips to help you get that project done right, get it done once, so you don't have to do it again, because nothing is, you know, less fun than doing that same project over and over again. Let's do it right, everybody. So let's get to it. The number here is one eight 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 Money Pit. Leslie, who's first? Building a new construction project. We've got Tina in Delaware. How can we help? Hi, Leslie. I was actually calling in regards to a home that we purchased about a year ago. And then um, throughout that year, we've just been uncovering a lot of um, a lot of problems um, with the house. And I was more curious to know whether there is a um, lemon law, so to speak. I'm not aware of a lemon law for new construction, but um, how long have you been in this house? It'll be, it was a year um, in November. And did you have a new home warranty on it? Uh, Yes. So they are coming back and and fixing the issues. Did you contact the warranty company or just the builder? My husband's been dealing with just the builder. So listen, a couple of things. This may or may not apply to you since it could possibly be too late. But if you buy a new home and it has a homeowner's warranty, notice to the builder does not constitute notice to the warranty company. So I would tell you right away to contact the warranty company. Let them know you've had problems because there are some things that there's coverage for beyond the first year. Of course, you get the most coverage in the first year. Secondly, make sure you're doing everything in right with both the builder and the warranty company so you have a record. I'm not aware of a lemon law situation, but if you've lost confidence in your builder and in the quality of the construction, what I might suggest you do is hire your own professional home inspector and have the building examined so this way you know whether or not it has any serious problems or not. It, you know, sometimes what you look at and think of as serious, you know, like a nail pop or something like that, or a door doesn't close right, you know, could be typical with new construction, but an independent expert can assure you or alert you if there really is a problem. Those would be my suggestions, you know, beyond speaking with an attorney if it gets real serious. But I think, first of all, you got to figure out you know, how deep you are in terms of issues with this house and then take the most appropriate steps. And I think having it evaluated by an independent expert, you should go to the American Society of Home Inspectors website to find one because those guys are the best. That's homeinspector.org, homeinspector.org. And then you'll find one in your area that can do a great job. Good luck with that project. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. 
All right, heading over to Texas, we've got Mike on the line who's got a question about a garage. What's going on? I've got a garage. I've been living here 40 years, and I've got a crack, about four cracks in my garage in slab. Okay. And I've talked to different contractors, and they said, well, I had to have it chiseled out and just re I was wondering if there's any epoxy or anything I can let, you know, put a top dressing cover over or anything. Yeah, so what are you concerned about here? Are you concerned about, uh, like, trip hazard? Is it, like, displaced from one side to the other, or is it really cosmetic? What's your concern? It's just cosmetic. If I ever wanted to sell it, people would see the cracks in it, you know. Well, first of all, you should understand that cracks in a garage floor are not structural. It's just a crack in the slab. It's most likely caused by shrinkage and settlement. It has no impact on the structural condition of the building. So you don't have to worry about seeing a crack in the floor and going, oh, I think the building is in bad shape. It's really not. It's, you know, think of it as a really durable rug, you know, over across the dirt floor. Right. If you want to try to deal with it. Two things. Quickcrete makes a number of crack fillers and sealers that you can uh, basically use like a caulking gun and insert it into the crack. And they sometimes will tell you to widen the crack a little bit, especially if it's hairline. And then beyond that, you could recoat that floor once you get those cracks sealed, just to stop moisture. Uh, and Dice Coatings makes a product called Die Hard. It's a garage floor coating kit, super durable, very beautiful, and that will leave that floor looking absolutely fantastic. So that's what I would do. I would seal the cracks, and then I would coat that entire floor with the Dice Coatings garage floor product. It really works very well, and it's a super durable product, and I think the garage will look fantastic. D-A-I-C-H coatings.com. Well, look, them up. Hey, I sure appreciate it. Y'all have a great show, and thank you so much for the help. All right, now we've got Pat on the line who's got a leak at home. What's happening? I have a wet spot up in the ceiling, and in the corner where the ceiling meets the wall. It's a new subdivision. I think it's about four years old. I called a guy out, and he told me it was that wall backs onto the laundry, and he said it was a vent. It was windblown rain because we've had some really bad storms and that there wasn't anything I could do about it but just fix it, cut out the sheetrock and that stuff and fix fix what's there. Yeah, that's going to happen again and again and again, <laughs> right? Yeah, I don't want to fix yeah. it every year. <laughs> yeah, no, that was, that, was, that was silly advice. Here's what you need to know. So first of all, it's a roofing repair. Uh, it depends on what type of, of, of uh, vent you have on that roof of the dryer, you know, some types of vents are a little more susceptible to wind-driven rain, especially if they're low to the roof where the rain kind of, you know, when the rain starts to go horizontal, it pushes up in there and then drips down. And, of course, the vent is not designed to be to contain water, so it's just going to leak out the lowest point, which seems to be right where you're seeing it. So you may have to change the type of roof vent that you have there so that it doesn't happen. You may need to have one that is uh, it's taller, it stands up off the roof, and it could even have a turn at the top, kind of like a candy cane turn at the top so it points down but lets that air exhaust. You don't want to have too many twists and turns because that blocks the, the flow of the of the lint getting out. But you may need a different size type of vent, uh, and that presumes that this leak is not just simply caused by the flashing around the vent. And an easy way to tell that is to run a hose up there and flood water from the top of the roof down over where this vent is and see if you cause the leak to occur, unless it's visible. I mean, sometimes I can look at these things and see that the flashing wasn't installed right or it wasn't overlapped correctly with the shingles. But I would eliminate that as a possibility, and then we're left with wind-driven rain. If that's a constant problem, then you're going to need to basically re- put in a new type of vent that is not as susceptible to the wind driving the water into your house. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. If it's a flashing, can I just seal around there? I would. I don't like to tell you to seal it because that's a temporary fix. If it's flashing, it, the roof can be remade around that, and you should be able to seal it properly just with the roofing material. If you go up there and you put a bunch of tar around it, not only does it look terrible, but it's going to crack again and open up, and you'll be doing it again and again and again. We don't like the Groundhog Day uh, types of repairs. <laughs> you know, We want you to do it once and be done with it shouldn't be leaking, and those are the two possibilities. So take a look, and, uh, and good luck with that. Hey, Money Pit Podcast fans. You want to help us out? Well, go ahead and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, and we're going to give you a virtual high five. Plus, you'll be helping us spread the word about our show. Just go to moneypit.com slash review. All right. Philip in Arkansas is on the line, has some questions about smart switches. How can we help? For about a month or so, I've 
been always kind of wanting to uh, turn uh, most of my uh, single single pole uh, light switches in my house into a smart switch. Well, such as, for example, my living room. Right. I've been trying to kind of think of, you know, how am I, how am I to do this? I'm an IT guy here thinking, you know, how can I, you know, turn an, I, an IT concept into electrical concepts? Well, I was doing some research and everything, and a lot of electricians were telling me, you need um, a ground wire, a neutral wire, and a load wire. Well, every single switch that I had been doing research and noticing out there all had four. I'm like, well, how am I to do this? Two loads, a ground and a neutral. How am I to do this? Well, it turns out that there was only one brand out there that I noticed anyways. That's why I was kind of turning to you guys because you know, when I hear y'all podcasts and everything, I'm always hearing how y'all are finding ways around things. So let me let me turn to these guys, see if they have, see if they have heard of anything else because I'm looking at all these different brands and they're all based off of, off of uh, four wires, two loads, a ground, and a neutral. My system doesn't have that. So that's why I was kind of hoping maybe y'all knew of something. One brand that I would recommend that we have a lot of personal knowledge of is Lutron Caseta, L-U-T-R-O-N, and Caseta, C-A-S-E-T-A. If you just you know Google Lutron Smart Home Products, this is a line of very sophisticated smart home smartphone controls. So they've got the switches. They've got all the different lighting systems. You can have mixed types of light on this. You can have all sorts of things. And it, and it uh, also is programmed in with the sun. So in the winter, like the lights come on outside earlier than they would in the summer and that kind of stuff. It's a really smart system and really well made. And the nice thing about Lutron is that they have a 24-7 call center that's staffed by technicians. So when you run into these types of questions, you can call them and they will have a solution for you. So I would recommend the Lutron by Caseta wireless smart home products very highly. I think you'll find your solution right there, and you won't have to deal with all of these opinions from all these electricians. You'll be able to do most of this yourself. These are the guys that invented the dimmer, okay? That's how long this company's been around. They were the first inventors of the dimmers. You know when they used to be big round knobs on the wall? <laughs> they invented it. They, so I would definitely... Take a look at the Lutron Caseta wireless system. I think you'll be satisfied with that. Thanks so much for calling us at one eighty eight Money Pit. Well, if you're thinking about adding hardwood floors to your home, you may be surprised to know that all hardwood floors are not the same. In fact, some can be more than twice as hard as others, and that also means that they're more durable. So here's how you can sort out those differences. So first, the hardness of wood flooring is determined by what's known as the Jenka rating, J-A-N-K-A. It's important to know this because the higher the Jenka rating, the harder the floor will be, which means it's less likely to wear and to dent. So, for example, red oak is probably the most common hardwood floor in most homes, and that has a Jenka rating of 1290, which is pretty much the industry benchmark for comparing the relative hardness of different wood species. Now, with older homes, softer woods like southern yellow pine are common, and that has a Jenka rating of 870, which is about a third less than today's standards. Now, for the highest Jenka ratings in flooring, the exotic solid hardwoods really top the scales. We're talking about hardwoods like Brazilian walnut, pecan, and chestnut with Jenka ratings over 3,000, which make them more than twice as hard as red oak and among the most durable selections of hardwood floor available today. Heading over to Maryland, we've got Jennifer on the line. What is happening at your money pit? I have a house. I live in the city, probably born built in the 1950s. And the question that I have is that the plywood that, is near the roof. I'm sorry, the plywood that is near the brick, it has a gap. My question to you is, can you fill that gap with foamatic installation? When you say the plywood that's near the roof, are you talking about like the soffit, the overhang? No, okay, you know what, not the soffit. I'm sorry, the plywood, it's like the siding. The siding, it's a flat roof house, okay? And then we have siding, and siding that actually is there you know, it probably looked like it had some type of roofing caulk or something there mm-hmm. to close up those gaps. Right. Can you use foam? Yeah. Because, you know, you just don't want birds or something to slip in there, or and then they right. can get behind right. your walls. So what's throwing me is that you, you generally you don't have plywood siding in a 1950s house. Generally, you have clapboard or, or, or other another type of wood siding. Yeah, it is, it is a 
of wood siding. Yes, it is okay. some type of wood siding. Right. So basically, we're talking about how do we fill a gap in wood siding, and you want to do this in a way that you don't have any rodents or birds or whatever can get in and out of that space. Probably the best thing to do is to fill it with steel wool because that will stop anything else from going into it. Now, is this under the soffit or is it going to be fully exposed to the weather? Because then we have to talk about how to kind of like, you know, make sure it's somewhat watertight too. Well, we we have a rubber roof on the house. The house okay. has a rubber roof on it. Right. It's just at the siding and it's, it's a plain house. The plain house is flat mm-hmm. and you have the, you know, I guess it's some type of wood. Right. And we just want to make sure it looked like before because it looked like it was white. So right. it looked like it was either some type of roofing caulk Right. Or some type of foam that was there yeah. to fill it. How big is this gap? Like, we're talking about a like quarter inch or an inch? Probably what? a quarter inch to a oh, half an inch. Oh, that's really tiny. Yeah. You can just caulk that. You may have to put it in in like two layers, but you can caulk that. That shouldn't be a big deal. And, you know, you want to caulk it and then you could paint right over it. Can you use foam attic also? What does that mean to you? What is foam attic? You mean spray foam insulation? Yeah, the spray foam insulation. You mean kind of in a can? Yes. All right. So you're talking about great stuff. And that's a expandable polyurethane insulation. Uh, could you use that? Well, yes, but, all right? So you could use that, and you would let it expand, and then you'd let it harden. And then after it's hardened, then you can go back with, like, utility night and cut it flush with the siding. But at that point, you would have to prime it and paint it because you can't leave it exposed to the weather because the sun will basically deteriorate that foam really quickly. It's not designed to be, uh, you know, weatherproof. So you could use it, but you would have to also prime it and paint it to protect it. So you can use it, and maybe you can taper. Once you cut it, you could taper it off with some type of roofing caulk, like you were mentioning. And that way, that would be almost like a double ceiling. If there's a big gap behind it, yeah, so you just want to use it to fill the space. Use it gently, okay? You're better off putting a couple of smaller applications of that stuff, because I'll tell you something about great stuff. If you just shoot a bunch of stuff into a hole like that, it expands, and I've seen it you know, push siding boards off the house or, like, swell the side framing of a window where the window won't open or close anymore. So use it carefully, all right? Thank you all very much for answering my question. I enjoy your show as always. It's always a learning experience for all those DIY folks out there. Thank you very much, Jennifer. (laughs) Happy to help you out. Good luck. We've got Barb in Delaware on the line who's got a question about insulation. Tell us about it. I have a uh, home that was built in... 1966, there was a time when you had the house insulated. It seems to be very good. My question is, do I need to have more insulation piped in? Well, Barbara, the 1966 house, you definitely are going to be due for more insulation because, frankly, the standards have changed over the years. And after all those years, I'm sure the existing insulation has settled and sagged and lost some of its buoyancy, which means it doesn't insulate very well. So the simple fix here is to add additional insulation to your attic. You would use unfaced fiberglass bats, probably 8 or 10 or 12 inches thick. You could lay them right on top of the existing floor or the existing insulation perpendicular to that, and that will restore a lot of insulation power to your house. That means you're going to be more comfortable and your heating bills are going to go down. Yeah, we've got Matthew from Illinois on the line who's looking for some ideas on what projects are best for the house. How can we help? I have a three-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath house. Uh, It's a ranch in a very um, desirable neighborhood for our area. And I'm wondering, uh, if we're trying to add some square footage, uh, if if it's a better value to do some underpinning and dig out a basement or to look at adding on a second story, um, what would be more cost-effective and what is better to affect the value of the house? That's a good question. I want to ask you about your neighborhood. Are most of the homes ranches, or are there some two-story homes around you? Um, it's about 50-50. So, I mean, my gut would tell me that putting a second floor on would probably be much more desirable to a home buyer. Having a basement is a, is a nice-to-have. I don't think it's a have-to-have, and it certainly doesn't replace the value that you would get by having a second floor with additional bedrooms and bathrooms because those are the things that really add to uh, the value of your home. You know, you could very simply get in touch with a local real estate agent. Perhaps there are usually realtors in all these areas that are just looking to develop their book of business, whether it's for uh, somebody that's going to sell now or sell in the future, and ask them that question. They may be able to look 
uh, at the listings and say, well, look, here's a house similar size to you with the finished basement and, you know, what that was worth compared to a home that maybe had a crawl space in the second story. I mean, the data is out there if you want to investigate your local area. But my gut would say that a second story would bring more value to your house than, a, than just a first floor with a finished basement. Leslie, what do you think? I mean, I think a finished basement is great depending on the type of people that are in the area. Is it more families? Is it more younger people? It's also the size of the house. So you have to kind of consider who the prospective user of the home is if you're trying to sell down the road. Well, it's definitely a family neighborhood. Um, I know I'm one of the only homes in the neighborhood that doesn't have a basement, um, but I do have a three-car garage, so I get that extra storage space from that and maybe some extra bedroom bathroom space would be more desirable. Matthew, I hope that helps you out. Good luck with the project. and Let us know what you decide. Well, here's a question to ponder, you guys. How often do you wash your bathroom towels? I mean, depending on how often it is, you might want to rethink that after you hear what researchers have learned about the amount of bacteria that grows in those towels. So here you go. A freshly washed towel, like just straight out of the dryer, already contains 190,000 counts of bacteria, but... That increases to 17 million counts of bacteria after one day of use, and it soars to as high as 94 million counts of bacteria after a week. I feel like a week is like, I don't know, four or five days is where I let it go, and then I'm like, "Ah, I I gotta wash all these towels. Well, not to let an alarming statistic go to waste, the folks at Showers to Use surveyed 2,200 people to ask how often they wash their towels and found that many of them were using their towels for a lot longer before giving them a freshen up. In fact, 3% of those surveyed wash their bathroom towels once a year. Almost one in 10 wash their, I know, wash their bathroom towels twice a year and a third Wash their bathroom towels once every three months. Gross, gross, and even grosser. That's disgusting. That towel is in your butt, and then it's on your face. Come on, people. This is terrible. Thanks for the visual. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, I do. you know, I always have like one towel for my hair and face and one towel for my body. And then like after two days, I'm like, I wash laundry. And if it gets to three days, four days, I'm like grossed out. So it's like, and the kids forget it. Like Henry will use a towel every single day. But Charlie, I think if I didn't like pry the towel off the bar, he'd use the same towel for his entire life. So who knows? I feel like there's, you know, reasoning to why these people do this. But get this. Men, sorry, Tom, and all the guys out there, you guys seem to have the least hygienic habits. Men were five times more likely to clean their bathroom towels just once a year. Gross. With 5% of males respondents admitting to giving them an annual wash compared to only 1% of women. So what do you think is the right number of times to use a towel before you wash it? I'm thinking like two to three. Two to three showers, like two to three days. Yeah. Yes. Two to three cleanups. If it's four, I'm grossed out. But, you know, I'm like, oh, shoot, I forgot. Or I'll just throw it in the hamper and take a fresh one. Might be four if it's the last towel, like on the rack, everything else is in the wash, you know. But two to three is pretty normal. (laughs) Could you imagine once a year? Maybe they thought they were asking, like, oh, take out all your towels from the closet. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Must be a misunderstanding. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to give. People I think some doubt. folks out there just don't have the same appreciation for bacteria buildup as you and I like. No more hugs. I'm not hugging anybody anymore. <laughs> now we've got Paula from Arkansas on the line. How can we help you? Well, I was looking for um, a sealer for my deck, but I also wanted it stained. I don't want it looking like the the wood, the original wood. The, I think it's pine. And I'd like to have it something um, to match the the trim of our home. Okay. I'd like a stain and a sealer all in one, if that's possible. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, you don't have to buy these things separate because exterior stains are just that. They are sealers and stains in one. What you need to know about it, Paula, is that you're going to have different choices on the, uh, on the transparency or the translucence of the stain itself because you can buy clear stain, which uh, is just that. It doesn't have any color. Or you can buy self semi-transparent, which is sort of a medium amount. Or you can buy solid color, which is completely opaque, although the grain will show through. You won't have any differentiation in grade. Semi-transparent will give you some differentiation. So you want to buy a good quality exterior stain. I would recommend solid color because it lasts a lot longer. 
Um, and in terms of which color you choose, there's lots of options. You can get, you know, a cedar, you can get a redwood, you can get sort of a nice sort of charcoal gray. Um, all the major manufacturers have a good selection of colors uh, with that product. Most importantly, you need to uh, do a good job on the prep. You'll follow the manufacturer's instructions, but generally you're going to want to pressure wash the deck and, and wait a few days of sunny weather so it dries out really nicely, and then you can apply the uh, solid color stain after that, okay? Okay, so this is a stain. It's a stain. It's, ex- it's an exterior stain. You don't, don't, don't get confused by looking for two products, okay? It's one product, exterior deck stain. It seals and stains together, okay? Okay, I was trying to confuse you, but I guess I can't. <laughs> nope, nope, I try harder. <laughs> Good luck. Thanks so much for calling us at one eight 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 Money Pit. Well, a new study found that over the next five years, a third of Americans believe severe weather events will leave their homes without power more often. Now, the poll of 2,000 U.S. homeowners found three in four have made improvements to their homes to address severe weather concerns, with a majority making modifications proactively to prevent future damage to the home. Yeah, and a homeowner stated that their top concerns as a result of severe weather are structural damage at 65%, power loss at 58 and third in the running, kind of surprising, is the safety of their family and friends. I guess you know where you rank <laughs> if it's a severe weather event. But this is not surprising but sad. Over one in four said they don't feel confident their local power provider can keep the power going during severe weather events. That's becoming more and more common across the country, which is the reason more and more folks are investing in whole house generators so they don't have to rely totally on the power company, especially if you really, really can't be without power. It's real important to have a backup system, and whole house is definitely the way to go. Prices came down on those a while ago, plus they run on natural gas, so you don't have to worry about getting gasoline since natural gas covers so much of the country, it's it's a pretty important update to make. I'm on my second one now. I've had it for over 20 years. Jackie in Florida is on the line with a dishwasher question. Tell us what's going on. Here's uh, my thing. It's a Whirlpool dishwasher. It's only four years old. And all of a sudden, just one day, a few weeks ago, just I noticed all, all the dishes just stopped drying. And... So I did some looking up. I did some troubleshooting. It could be this. It could be that. And now they seem to be washing but just not drying. But now the, mm-hmm. there's mold building up in it as well. Yeah. And I've even noticed that. Like, it's still hot. If I pull it right after the cycle's done, it's still you could still feel the warmness of it. But, but, you, got it, but you have to hand dry them, in other words. Right. Well, usually if the dishwasher is not drying, the problem is in the heating element. The fact that they're warm is probably just the hot water that you're using to wash it with because dishwashers are, you know, are hooked up to the hot water side. Uh-huh. But the, uh, the heating element is that the electric coil that's in the bottom of the dishwasher, and that may have failed. But you got a decision to make because you just mentioned you have a four-year-old dishwasher, and having somebody come out and diagnose it and repair it is probably going to cost you 200 or 250 bucks. So right. uh, un- what you got to figure out is whether or not you want to risk that or just go ahead and scrap it and go and order yourself a new one. When it gets right. to be middle aged like that, it doesn't always make sense to to repair it. Right. And here's the, here's the thing. Like even I've tried to even look up online to see if I can buy the heating element myself yep. and then replace it myself. But well, you certainly can do that. The part, the part number doesn't come up. I can't find a matching part to it. And so then I talked to Whirlpool, and, of course, they want to send someone out. And- Did you try Sears? Because I think Sears has Whirlpool parts, and they're really good about uh, about stocking a lot of parts and also taking them back if they don't fit. Do I have to pull it out of the cabinet? to get to the screw to unhook it or does it pull right? I wouldn't know without looking at it, you know, and that's the other thing. You're going to be diving into something that you're unfamiliar with and it might just be that, again, it just doesn't, you know, it, it just uh, doesn't work. So I'm sure right. that somebody out here has had that problem before and has a, a YouTube video waiting for you to look at. <laughs> <laughs> There's a YouTube yeah, video for everything. 
Yeah. Right. Exactly. You can do everything on YouTube. No, and that's actually what I've I looked into is YouTube as well. That's how I figured out how to fix anything and everything these days well, is YouTube. You. That's great. Um but I didn't know if there was like a simple way. You know, I cleaned it well, I scrubbed everything down thinking maybe that was the problem. Because you know how dirty they get and clogged up. So I yeah. don't know. Well, like I said, I don't think it's a clog situation because if you told me your dishes weren't coming out clean, then we'd be having a different conversation. But it sounds like they're just not drawing, and that's most likely going to be that coil. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I think you just made the, my final decision. All right. Well, we're glad we could help you out. That's what we do. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Hey, you guys, you can call us at 1 888 Money Pit, or you can also post your question online by going to one of our many social media feeds. And that's what Rob did. All right. So Rob wrote in saying, I live in a 23-year-old ranch-style home with an 812 roof pitch. Now, the roof structure is made of ceiling joists and rafters rather than trusses and has blown-in insulation. The blown-in insulation has begun to settle some, so I'm considering upgrading to spray foam insulation. Is it better to have the foam installed between the ceiling joists or between the rafters? That is a very, very good question, Rob. I did this project in my house, and I pondered the same. And I decided that the place that you normally would put spray foam insulation would be between and even over the roof rafters. Because that's where the heat's going to rise to, and that's where you want to stop it, right? But the question is, what did I do with the existing insulation that was in the ceiling joists? Well, I left it, of course, because why get rid of it? Kind of had a doubly warm attic as a result of that. And after I got done installing the spray foam, they sprayed not only the ceiling rafters, but the end walls, and everything was really sealed up tight because you don't have to ventilate an attic anymore that's spray foam. Man, what a huge difference it made. When I go up my attic now, uh, even in the cold of winter, it's the same temperature really as sort of the rest of the house. It just holds the heat. It doesn't leak any of the heat out. So heat that used to escape around, you know, around light fixtures or around, uh, say, the attic hatchway, that sort of thing, it just doesn't get up there. And so it's really quite comfortable. So good choice. All right. Now we have Robert in Rhode Island who wrote in saying, I need to replace my water pressure regulator. He says, we were surprised when a plumber gave us a quote of $950. Is this something we can replace on our own? Hmm. Well, that's a crazy high price, Rob. The new regulator is about $50 apart. It's got threaded fittings, so there's no soldering required. And if you find one that's the same size and shape as the old one, it doesn't have to be soldered in place. So it's pretty easy. I would just make sure... Uh, it's on the house side of the main water valve. And remember that once you remove it, all the water that's in the pipes in the house are going to drain, it's going to drain out. So unless there's a second main water valve somewhere to stop that, you have to expect that that's going to happen. If you can't do it yourself, you need to shop for another plumber. But I had a similar experience with a heating contractor that I, before this experience, actually thought was pretty good. Uh, but I needed a transformer and I said, great. Do you have one on the truck? They go, yeah. I said, well, how much is it? And the guy says, well, I got to call the shop. So he calls the shop, and they quoted him a price of $500 for this transformer. Well, a little bit of research found that the exact same transformer, not not even like a different brand, I mean the same one, was $35 at Home Depot, which to me was a – I figured it out to be a 1400 to 1500% markup, which I think is kind of ridiculous. So guess what? They just lost a customer as a result of that kind of behavior. So I think that's what you got to do. You're the consumer. You have the power to decide who you're going to work with and who you're going to not work with. And if they're going to take advantage uh, of you, especially with extraordinary pricing like that. And thankfully for me, it wasn't an emergency. But can you imagine if it's an emergency, how those kinds of prices, people don't even blink at them. They don't know any better, and they're really grossly overpaying. So I think if you've got somebody like that, you just got to find a different plumber. That's all there is to it. Yeah, I mean, that really is a lot of money. So it's like you always, you're right, you have to compare those estimates. You have to make sure they're comparing the same things, the same type of product. And then make sure you're getting the best deal with the right person to do the job. You are listening to the Money Pit Home Improvement Show. Thanks so much for spending a bit of your day with us. We hope we've been helpful as you tackle projects around your house or come up with some ideas for things that you want to get done. You can always reach out to us any time of the day or night by going to moneypit.com slash ask, clicking the blue microphone button, or simply picking up the phone and calling us at 888 Money Pit. 
Until then, I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. Remember, you can do it yourself. But you don't have to do it alone. The name says it all. When you focus solely on indoor comfort for 43 years, well, you get really good at it. Get your heating or cooling system tuned by a Vernon specialist today for only $69. Vernon's 60 to 90 minutes of meticulous system inspection guarantees energy savings or the tune-up is free. Now that's a value. Go to vernonheating.com. Without the ones like you who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.